Welcome everyone to AZ Bio Peers. In this session, um, Jason Jardine, who is an AZ Bio board member and importantly, um, a partner at Kenobi Martins, um, is going to be talking about things we need to know on intellectual property. Um, Jason's clients include fast growth and emerging companies. He is experienced with helping people get that very first patent, which is the hard one, as well as helping people that have huge patent portfolios, both nationally and internationally. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Jason, who will be sharing his screen. Take it away. Thank you all for coming this early in the morning and uh, to see this presentation. This is kind of a a rehash of a presentation that uh, I gave to the Arizona Bio uh, Peers Group uh, just a few weeks before COVID happened. And because of that, we were still meeting in person at that time at the Arizona Commerce Authority. And they asked me to redo this because Pick they weren't the taking it. This session is to talk about some intellectual property essentials, and we can dive into a lot of different uh, aspects here about your intellectual property. But I'm going to look more specifically at uh, provisional and PCT strategies and then run through some uh, aggressive portfolio growth uh, uh, programs uh, that you could probably do with your patents. Um, but today, let's see, the first thing um, is that we're going to look at, oh, well, this is me. And Joan already uh, mentioned a little bit about me, and I work with small companies and big companies and a lot of different things. And in, I wanted to mention one thing that I do that's outside of the life science area, which is fashion. Uh, for the last uh, almost 15 years, I've worked with San Diego Fashion Week designers um, on helping them protect their uh, innovations, both in um, accessories and also clothing lines and helping them a little bit with branding. Um, and that's been kind of a fun thing um, outside of the life sciences. And life sciences is where I spend uh, the vast majority of, of my time. Um, I'll tell you just a little bit about my firm. Um, I, uh, let's see here. Uh, my firm is called Kenobi Martins. Uh, we have um, somewhere between 250, 275 uh, lawyers um, in, in our firm. I'm not really sure of exactly the number, and that's what I said. It's We have over 250 lawyers. We're all um, uh, almost 98, 99% have technical degrees. Um, most of them are many of them with advanced degrees in that subject. So everything from computer science to rocket science and whatever in between. Our largest offices, as I mentioned here on this slide, are in California and Washington, D.C., and Seattle and New York. Um, I spend a fair amount of time in, in Arizona, but my official residence is actually in San Diego. I grew up in Arizona and, and have a soft spot in my heart, and so I'm there all the time. Um, yeah, our firm, you know, gets lots of awards, and these are some from just the last uh, about six or eight months, um, you know, in uh, trademark and branding and litigation, and but every every type of intellectual property that is available, where we do pretty well in it. Um, okay, today, what what we're going to talk a little bit about is um, patents, and that's where I spend a fair amount of of time counseling clients is how to get and how to use their patents. Um, and why do people or why do businesses get patents? Most of the op, uh, most of the reason they get them is as a business tool. Now, there are a, a few fringe folks who do it for their ego only. I had a, um, a fellow who, who came to me and said, hey, I've invented something and I really want a patent. And I said, well, you're going to build a business? He said, no, I... I um, my brother got a patent, so I want to show that I have a patent too. So we we helped him with his his innovative concept uh, that he did out of his garage, and he got his he got his patent. He actually did end up selling a little bit of a product uh, on the side, but I'm not sure that uh, he he made lots of money off of it. But most of the time, people are using patents as a business tool, either to try and get 
licensing revenue into the company or to enhance the company value so that uh, investors get excited and want to um, uh, want to throw money at, at the company. Um, sometimes it's it's to position themselves with respect to a competitor company, either offensively because they want to try and, and keep another competitor out of the market or um, potentially defensively to try and uh, keep other companies away from the space that they are in. Um, also mentioned that they help stop employee theft because employees are aware that the company is taking their IP rights very seriously. Um, business value, uh, so, so businesses increase their value hugely um, by intangible assets, including any type of IP, patents, trademarks, copyrights. And over this, this graph is showing that over the last number of years, that value of companies in the S&P 500 skews towards the intangible assets more and more and more. Um, I need to update this slide and, and give one from, uh, from 2025 uh, next year. So that'll be great. Also, um, IP valuation includes not just patents, it includes um, uh, potential, uh, you know, present value, expected future benefits, intangible assets, and the tangible assets. So the tangible assets could be actual products um, or things on that you're putting on the market, but many of the intangible assets are, are IP related and trade secret related. Thing. And I should mention that, that um, while copyrights and trademarks may be well known to this group, trade secrets may not be. And trade secret is anything of value that the company uh, or that the company considers a value and can keep secret can be uh, held as a trade secret. And so people who steal those and try to use gain economic benefit from them, you can sue them um, uh, from on those, uh, both on federal statutes and also in, in state statutes. So when you're trying to protect life science IP, um, you have to think that the IP is going to have an outsized view or an outsized component of the, uh, the total valuation of the company for at least the, the first part of the company before the company is revenue producing. After that, it takes more of a backseat as the company is, is selling products or whatever whatever types of maybe it's medical devices maybe it's it's uh, other methods of doing things maybe it's a um, you know selling uh, uh, pharmaceuticals or or uh, small molecules or um, in in the chemistry side or maybe a uh, antibodies or other uh, biotech type inventions now we would and I would, advise um, those those companies to make sure that you are not just focused on patents, but you're also thinking about how to protect your software, um, maybe with copyrights or how to protect your websites or how to protect your um, your packaging um, or your branding, um, all of which can be done with with uh, trademarks and copyrights. I mentioned earlier protecting your trade secrets. Um, and, and keeping track of what your trade secrets are is uh, a, a very helpful thing. Identifying them, things, your, your customer list, your, your um, business plan, things that you, you keep secret and don't want your, your competitors to get a hold of. You're trying, you know, really the goal here is to try and, and create barriers for your competitors so that they can't come in and just take your ideas and, and use them. Um, you're also trying to monetize or get value out of those uh, uh, intellectual property assets that you do have. So here is a sample framework for trying to decide what you want to patent. And there's a, there's a lot of different ways to, to do this, but you're trying to figure out, well, what, what value will this, uh, this idea have to the company? And... This is this particular, um, uh, you know, 
graph or, or the, this uh, um, spreadsheet here just gives a one potential framework that your company might want to use. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to get into this too too specifically, just because it's these can be these can vary quite a bit from company to company. But you want to think about all of the concepts here. W what value will this give you to the company? Is it core to the technology that you are doing, um, or is it more peripheral? Hey, you know, we discovered this, but it's not it's not going to really impact the value of our main core product. Um, is it going to drive revenue or is it going to block competitors? Um, is it going, are you going to be able to figure out who the infringers are easily? Um, or is it going to, you know, be difficult to try and figure out infringers? One, one way to think about infringement is you have to be able to see what the competitor is doing. Um, so if they are doing it in a warehouse, you won't know whether or not you are or they are infringing a, a patent application or a patent that covers maybe your method of making or your method of, of um, scaling up. Um, if that's all done back behind the scenes, you can't figure out who the infringer is very easily. Um, but if, if your, uh, your patent is on a product and you're able to see what the competitor product is, it's much more easy, easy to figure out whether or not infringement will be uh, uh, can be proven. So anyway, these are just some ideas as as to how you can in, within your company decide whether or not you want to try and file patent applications and protect your inventions. So uh, back to what is a patent? You know, with with all kinds of uh, th this may seem like a very basic question. But um, I find that there are some misconceptions um, because patents are supposed to keep others out of the market. Um, so you're, what the patent is, is it gives you a right to exclude others. So the picture on the right side of the screen where you basically have a fence around a piece of land, that's what a patent actually does. It keeps people out of that. What people often think of is that they think that the patent is a fence and it protects everything that is done within that fence. But that's not that's not accurate because um, your your patent uh, uh, what what's within the fence may already be known in the prior art, uh, may be known by others and used by others without without infringement. And so what you are doing is you are building a fence around an area where you recognize that nobody has ever done this combination of things before and that your combination is both useful and non-obvious. So those, those things that can be patented, processes, machines, manufacturers, compositions of matter, need to meet those statutory hurdles to, to keep others out of the market. Um, and again, I, I posted here on this uh, slide that it's for about 20 years. It's 20 years from the date of first non-provisional filing of your application. Now, the reason I say it's about 20 years is because it's possible to get a little bit of patent term extension at the patent office if you if your patent uh, if, if because of delays at the patent office. It's also possible to get a little bit of extended patent term. Uh, from the FDA if you have a product that is delayed at the FDA. It's possible to get just a little bit of extension there too. It's, uh, one is called patent term adjustment, which is at the, at the patent office. The other is patent term extension, which is from the FDA. So, uh, but it's, it's, it's approximately 20 years. And that's the reason why I, I stick that there. Now, again, I mentioned what is it that you can patent any kind of process, machine, manufacturer, composition of matter, uh, you want something that's new, meaning nobody's ever done it before. It's useful. Here's a good good uh, um, decal or of something that's useful, which is the you know um, the Swiss Army knife, and something that's non-obvious, like two plus two is five for very large values of two. Um, and generally, what I mean by non-obvious is that you aren't just taking your red wagon 
and painting it blue because that red wagon or that blue wagon still functions the same way as the red wagon. It doesn't make it any faster or better than the red wagon. It is new in that nobody, nobody thinks of painting that red wagon blue, but it is not non-obvious. It would still be obvious. So think about something that, that uh, moves the needle a little bit in terms of inventive step. Also back to the concept of infringement. Um, so this is a possible patent claim. A possible patent claim is your medical device having component A, B, C, and D. So D is your improvement, A, B, and C are kind of known concepts in, in the art. And if a competitor happens to own A or B or C, it's possible the competitor could block you from using this, this particular patent. But if your competitor makes or uses or sells or offers to sell or imports into the United States all of A, B, C, and D, then that competitor would infringe your claim one. Okay. Now, again, requirements to, to get a patent, you don't have to develop any product or prototype. You can file as soon as you have your idea. You must disclose it to the patent office. You must enable somebody of ordinary skill in the art to make and use the invention. You must describe the best mode of making the invention. And the invention as claimed must, as, as mentioned previously, be novel and non-obvious over the prior art. So I've, I've given a, an older version of a, an actual granted patent uh, as a decal here on this um, uh, slide, but patents now, are issued only electronically. So there is an electronic patent grant, and that is the official document that, that um, issues. It's no longer in hard copy. Um, the, the patent office has for several uh, uh, months of a, a transition period, ha have been giving those, those um, uh, the ribbon copies still, but the, the patent office is stopping doing that and all and the official legal document is actually a an electronic uh, uh, patent certificate now. OK, so here we're going to talk just a little bit about U.S. and, and foreign patent protection. And, and we want to talk a little bit about um, where you should file and also some strategies for dealing with um, provisional patents in the United States and PCT patents or PCT patent applications. Actually, provisional patent applications, PCT uh, patent applications. So where do you wanna file? You wanna file where your sales are, where your customers are, where your manufacturing is. Um, you may want to file where your competitors are if you want to um, really foul up their business. Um, Patents, as, as mentioned here, are national in nature. So a U.S. patent can't stop somebody from doing something in South Africa. Um, but if you file in South Africa, you can stop somebody from making, using, selling, uh, offering for sale or importing in South Africa. Think about it this way. Um, the more places you file your patent applications, the more likely you are to be able to cover significant markets in the globe, but also you get a, a significantly higher cost there. And I would, I would think about um, in many other countries, what are your enforcement mechanisms? Because in the US, it's, very, it's, it's relatively straightforward to enforce patents, but there are certain countries where you can get a patent but it's almost impossible to enforce. Um, so a market, and when you're considering your markets, markets outside of the US, can you as your company, can you tolerate a foreign competitor supplying unprotected markets? Meaning if you file in the United States and maybe you do so, you know, some work in Mexico, maybe you have some in Canada, maybe you have some in Europe, can you, are, are you okay with some competitors selling your products in uh, Nigeria or in Bolivia? Um, because you can't possibly be monitoring in uh, all of those places. Are you okay with that? Um, are you satisfied again with, with US protection only? Because the US 
uh, U.S. not only is where you are based, because most of most of the audience here are U.S. Uh, based companies, um, but also the U.S. is a major market, probably the largest market for whatever it is that you were doing. Um, and and uh, after the United States, you need to think about, well, what other markets do you really care about? Where are you going? And are you going to get there before the 20 year term of the patent is up? Um, so there's a lot of considerations here as you're trying to think about where you want to file, uh, your, your, your patent applications. I have companies that, that say, look, we're only going to hit the major markets in us and Europe. We're not going to worry about anywhere else. I have those who do us, Europe, Japan, um, for, for certain biotech inventions. I also have pharma, uh, companies who will file. Um, in a number of major country, countries, U.S., uh, Mexico, Brazil, Canada, Australia, um, uh, China, Japan, um, India, uh, Europe, South Africa. You, and that's, that's about 10 uh, big ones. And, and for most pharma companies, you're thinking about all of those places um, and maybe even a few more. Okay, so the patent process, um, there, there is a preparation phase and a filing phase. So once, once there is a, you know, you've decided internally at the company that you do want to um, file a patent application, or maybe the inventor just submits the inventor, inventor disclosure form, invention disclosure form to in-house counsel or somebody Maybe the CEO is wearing multiple hats and the CEO says, OK, um, we're going to file on this one. So there's a disclosure or an inventor disclosure meeting with outside counsel with somebody like me or, or another uh, attorney. And we say, OK, let's let's tease out the invention. Maybe we will do a prior art search. Maybe we will go and actually say, all right, what is an examiner going to look at someday when the examiner um, uh, uh, picks up the application to look at it and trying to trying to know what an examiner is going to see someday helps us in formulating or, or writing the application to try and um, explain why we are new and different than those things that are in the prior art. Um, at that point, you, you should also consider whether you want trademark protection, whether the claims and drawings are prepared or reviewed. And then you want to file the application. Um, you need to decide, do you want to file it as a provisional application or a non-provisional application? In the United States, we have the opportunity to do either of these things. A provisional application, and we're going to talk about this in just a minute, U.S. provisional applications are good for two years or just, just one year. At the end of 12 months, you need to file your non-provisional application to claim priority to that provisional application. Here are two filing strategies for provi provisional applications. One is you file your provisional, you wait 12 months, and then you file your, your non-provisional application. Non-provisional is the application that will, in fact, get examined by an examiner. Another uh, strategy, you file a single provisional application that may have multiple inventions in it, and then you file non-provisional applications spread out um, on the different inventions that are in that provisional application. So that's another one. Here's another possibility that, that um, I, I have used with a number of companies like Ignita was another, was a big company that was a pharma company. And what they like to do is they like to file a, uh, a provisional application, add material to it, add data to it, and then add another uh, uh, provisional application that basically added the new material. And then a couple of months later, they would add some more material. And they might have two, three, seven provisional applications. And at the end of that 12-month period from their original uh, provisional filing, they roll up that provisional into one non-provisional US or PCT application. This is called a rolling provisional strategy. And um, this works really well when you want to get your stake in the ground 
and then you your company is generating data uh, over the course of that year. And, and every time you get new data, you add it to the application and roll it right in. And uh, this, this is a great strategy for that kind of a thing. Um, here's a comparison uh, between provisionals and non-provisional applications in the US. Provisional applications do not publish during that, that 12 month period. Um, regular applications do publish at 18 months from their earliest priority. So if you have a provisional application and then you file your non-provisional application, 18 months from when your provisional was filed, that non-provisional will publish. And also the, the provisional will publish at that point, but it, it becomes public, public as part of the uh, publication of the non-provisional application. So provisional expires after 12 months, regular applications remain pending until they're reviewed. Um, and once you get the patent, it will expire, assuming you pay all of the maintenance fees, it will expire after 20 years from that non-provisional filing. Um, provisionals can't become a, file, uh, a patent. It doesn't mature into that. There's no examination. There's no formatting guidelines or claims you are not required. So in a provisional application, frequently, um, I will have somebody come to me and say, hey, I have this, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm presenting a paper tomorrow at a conference, this, this important conference. Um, I just thought I should file a, uh, my patent application. Well, there is no time to create a patent application in an, in, in an, you know, an afternoon. And so what you do is, is you file as quickly as you can in a, a provisional state because I could file the paper they are going to present, and that is a provisional application. I could also file some scribbly, scribbly something on the back of a napkin, and that would be a provisional filing. You don't, it, there's no particular format for provision. I would advise, however, to get as much information in your provisional application as you possibly can, so that um, you have a good priority, a, a good um, disclosure as, as part of your priority, because an examiner later in your non-provisional application will look at that and see if you are really entitled to priority on everything that is in your claims all the way back to your provisional filing. So there's also some differences in provisional and non-provisional filing between contributors and inventors, because in non-provisional filing, inventorship is, is based upon what's in the claims of the patent application. Inventorship, we could talk about inventorship for uh, days. There are lots of, um, there's a lot of, of judicial ink that has been spilled over what constitutes an inventor. But really for, for our purposes today, an inventor is the first person who conceived of the invention that is embodied in the claims. Okay, so question, should you file internationally? We talked a little bit about um, thinking about your markets, your different markets. There is, um, and if you have markets that are outside of the United States, or if you want to delay uh, uh, examination in the United States, then you should consider filing a patent cooperation treaty, a PCT application. PCT application is not a patent. It's similar to a provisional application in that it doesn't mature into a patent. Um, but at the end of its lifetime, you, it, it must be converted into a patent application in every region or country of interest. So this is as close as you're going to get for a, you know, a worldwide patent application because it, the PCT um, the, the treaty has been signed by 150, I think it's 157 countries as of uh, not too long ago. So 150 plus countries. And in any, in, in any of those countries, you could enter into after uh, filing your PCT application. Those countries include the United States. So PCT applications, you can file a single application with claims. You secure your option to pursue that patent protection in all of those 150 plus countries. So that includes US, it includes China, but it doesn't include Taiwan or Argentina. 
but almost every major market that you can think of is part of the PCT uh, uh, treaty. You can, so this, this can allow you to uh, delay examination in particular countries for up to 30 months from your original priority date. So when I say original priority, if you file your US provisional application, at the end of that 12 month period, you can file your PCT application. You get an additional 18 months on top of that, 30 months from your original uh, provisional filing before you can then enter, um, then before you must at that point enter the US or any other countries that you want to enter for national phase. Uh, the costs of filing are anywhere from uh, to about 2000 to about 4,500, depending upon who you select as the searching authority. I have another slide on that in just a minute. Um, so instead of a U.S. application, one way to delay examination in the U.S. is to file provisional PCT and then in the United States. That could delay examination in the United States if you want to. So patent protection in China and elsewhere, there are a lot of, um, I, I meet with a lot of companies who are very hesitant to file in China. For, for many biotech companies and pharma companies, I would advise vi uh, filing in China. Um, part of the hesitation is uh, because China has had a history of um, not being great in enforcing uh, IP rights, uh, particularly for um, companies that are not uh, homegrown in China. Um, that has changed substantially over the last 30 years. Um, and, and their enforcement in China is much better now than it was and much more fair now, even to companies that are not uh, local companies. Um, so, and China is a major big market. So it's something to think seriously about. Uh, but uh, as met, mentioned earlier, whenever you're thinking about foreign filing, you have to in, include the cost, um, cost of translations, costs of filing, and, and factor that into your budgeting. Um, also understand that certain types of claims are more difficult to get in um, different countries. Um, in the US, for example, uh, we have a difficult time getting diagnostic claims uh, uh, because the Supreme Court has said that there are problems with diagnostic claims and they should not be patent eligible. Um, in countries outside of the United States, like Europe or Australia, diagnostic claims are just fine. Um, anyway, there's a lot of these diff these kinds of nuances. And, and when we, we decide what markets are important, we also have to factor in the, the nuances to the law and whether or not you're going to be able to get something that's strong and enforceable in those countries. So here is a typical PCT timeline. You file your application, uh, the, uh, your, your local application, you claim priority filing your PCT application. You get what's called an international search report and written opinion, usually about four months after your PCT filing. And with that international search report and written opinion, if it is favorable, meaning that you have at least one claim that is considered novel and inventive and has utility, then you can use that, that allowable claim to enter certain markets through what's called the patent prosecution highway. I'll get to that in just a minute. Here are some other deadlines that can happen in, in a PCT case. You can, if you disagree with the international search report and written opinion, you can file a demand. You can uh, amend your claims. You can request that the examiner respond to you, and the examiner will respond to a demand with what's called an international preliminary report on patentability, maybe revising the examiner's original finding, maybe not. That, that, IPR, yeah, um, the, that IPRP can also be used for patent prosecution highway purposes. And then at the end of the, pat the PCT lifetime, you enter the national phase in the particular countries that you care about. So I was talking about search reports and written opinions. It's, it, a search report is performed by the ISA, who is the International Searching Authority. 
that ISA is chosen at the time that you uh, uh, file your PCT application. And depending upon how much you want to spend, you may get a better ISR or WO. You, you may get a better search um, or a more careful search than it does in, in you know, with other uh, ISAs. So for example, here, and when you're trying to select an ISA, here are potential countries that could be your international searching authority. Most of the time, people will use the US or Europe because they are kind of the gold standard. They are more pricey, um, but if your invention is worth it, you do want a good search. So if, for example, I have a, uh, a US application and also a PCT application that are proceeding in parallel, I will choose for my international searching authority, I may choose the European Patent Office so that I have two different sets of eyes looking at a, a very similar invention. Reasons why somebody might use um, uh, Korea, and this is Republic of Korea, South Korea or Australia, is that they are less expensive. Um, these, and, and they do a good job, but uh, you, I don't wanna get in trouble here, but they, they are often not as careful in their searches as either the US or the European Patent Office. So take that for what it's worth. That's that's my opinion. The, the uh, Russian Federation I have taken off here because that's an option, but uh, due to sanctions against Russia, uh, the con uh, other countries are not recognizing searches that are being performed by the Russian uh, Federation. So, we, whereas we might have used to, we, we might used to use Russia for purposes of searching because it was extremely inexpensive um, compared to everywhere else. It was very, very inexpensive, um, especially when you have a very, very cost conscious client and it doesn't matter what the searching the search report says, then using the Russian search uh, federation made a lot of sense. But now since other countries are not recognizing the authority due to uh, the war and sanctions against Russia, uh, we're not using Russia anymore uh, for that purpose. Okay, uh, other international search reports, I mentioned that what this is gives you a list of relevant prior art documents. It makes a determination of whether the claimed invention is novel, whether it has what's called inventive step, which is kind of an equivalent to obviousness or non-obviousness, and whether it has utility. And that comes up in the international search report. And the time limit uh, is supposed to be, uh, um, you know, three to four months after um, the PCT application is filed, if there is an earlier priority, or it's within about 16 months uh, of, of when the, the PCT application is filed. That should be in a roughly equivalent time, whether the PCT application is filed first or whether the PCT application is filed claiming priority to an earlier uh, uh, application. Now, this is a, you know, I'm gonna show you an example of, a, of an ISR. An ISR will come out looking something like this with a list of documents they consider to be relevant uh, listed in the middle. On the uh, left-hand side, you see X's and Y's. X's are what, what are called novelty destroying references um, and Ys are references that are supposed to impact the inventive step or the obviousness of claims. And an A reference is something that is relevant. It's in the art, but it doesn't actually impact or it doesn't uh, uh, impact either the novelty or the inventive step of claims. And on the right side of this slide shows you which claims are being impacted by that particular re relevant uh, reference. So that's what it looks like. And the written opinion of the International Search Authority comes out, it's non-binding on, on novelty invented step and industrial applicability or uh, utility. It's established at the same time as the ISR, it's made available to the public, <clears throat> and you can file a demand to argue against it uh, at the PCT stage if you, you pay an extra fee and explain to the patent office why they're wrong. This is another part of the ISR and written opinion. 
explaining uh, which claims are impacted by novelty, invented step, and industrial applicability, and then ex uh, giving some uh, uh, brief explanation as, as to that application. So as, as I mentioned, you can argue against it um, as long as you do that within 22 months and pay a fee. And once you do, uh, argue against it filing a demand that the uh, International Searching Authority look at uh, the analysis again, uh, they are required to respond with an IPRP uh, thereafter, an international uh, preliminary report on patentability. I mentioned earlier that there is something called the patent prosecution highway. So when you have a favorable result in certain countries, maybe one of the countries has decided either at the PCT stage or at first filing of a non-provisional application that you have allowable claims, then filing an application in one of the other member countries through patent prosecution highway, they will start their examination from the allowable subject matter found in the, uh, the, the earlier uh, search. And so that, that will expedite examination it doesn't always result in an immediate allowance, but it will uh, uh, expedite examination and usually make uh, uh, make things happen faster. It usually help helps you get to patent faster, patentability faster in multiple countries. And this is just a, a map of a bunch of different countries that have these kinds of bilateral treaties. Okay. Um, I think I think you know for tips and conclusions. Why don't Why don't we talk about some of the if, if people have uh, questions? Why don't we treat those for tips and conclusions? But in summary, I think that you should you should um, make sure that you are thinking seriously about your provisional filing strategy and also your PCT filing strategy to maximize your portfolio uh, for minimal cost. So, all right. So with that. What questions have you? I have a couple that I want to ask. Well, I, sh so, I should say I should say first of all that it's quite a bit different experience to give this here rather than giving this at the ACA four years ago because of the interaction that we had the audience there that was really kind of fun. But anyway, that's all right. I'm going to put you in the hot seat. <laughs> Do it. Fire away. All right. So, um, many of um, our life science companies um, utilize patents that were supported by federal funds. And in 1980, the Bayh-Dole Act, you know, created a pathway so that companies, universities, et cetera, could do that. But that adds complications. So if I am working with federally funded research, how does that affect my patent process? That's a very good question. So one thing that you have to do when it is identify on the face of your patent application that the patent was uh, worked on with um, a subject to a particular grant from the NIH, from the, the, the DOE, from you know DOJ, who, from whoever it, it comes from. It could any federal alphabet soup organization, um, you have to identify it on the face of the patent. And it means that the government could have certain rights to the invention. They're called march in rights. And that the government, however, has not in the past, the government traditionally does not use those. So, so it's, it has been a, um, uh, a, a, a non-issue for, for about 30 years. Um, and recently the, the Biden administration has talked about trying to use the, the Buy Dole Act margin rights to um, lower drug prices um, as, as this is a, is a tool to put pay, um, um, pressure on companies. Now, that gets into a lot of um, interesting politics um, and, and, and a bigger question of whether or not those march in rights used by the government would actually do anything on the drug prices. That's, that's another question entirely. <laughs> but um, I, I would not hesitate as a, as a small company to use the federal funds because I think it's highly unlikely that the government will ever um, actually use the march in rights. 
and and using that the grant money is is free money that doesn't hurt your cap table and you know there is just for our the people that have joined us there is something called the buy dole coalition which i would encourage you to check out there's some great information about those discussions and, and what's going on and um senator um dole and senator by obviously are not in senate anymore um, but Senator Bai has been, you know, quite vocal throughout this process, explaining that price was never intended um, to be part of the march and rights scenario. Um, it was only intended when somebody was shelving a useful technology because they didn't want somebody else to have it. And so, um, so those are things that that we look at. Now, um, one of the questions that we have is. And this has been a really hot subject now, you know, with drug pricing and other things is, you know, um, patent extensions, patent improvements. You know, I've I've created my product. I now know more. I have a better, new, improved, novel solution. When do I pull the trigger on that next patent? Um, I would as soon as as soon as it is is a fully formed idea, I would file on it. Um, the there is benefit to getting it on file because right now um, the way we determine who got there first is by who filed first at the patent office. And so as soon as you have a, a fully formed idea or or good data, I would file right then. Um, don't don't sit on it um, too long. Um, and that, that's, that's my recommendation. Um, if you are still tweaking it, if you, st you know, still investigating, you're not sure. Okay. Put it off. Uh, but, but, uh, it also doesn't hurt to file multiple provisional applications, file that provisional application, add to it, file something different. And if at the end of that year, you can put them together or you could, you know, maybe keep some of them out. So um, China and India, okay, you touched on China a little bit. You know, when we talk about healthcare, right, we're treating people. China yeah. and India have the most people. Um, and historically, China and India have been lower cost of operation markets for certain components of things that we create. Um, they also, China more than India, have have as you said, you know, in the past been enforcement challenges, um, just because the courts, especially in China, can can be very complex and regional as well, well as national in scope. So, um, I don't have a lot of money. If I did have a problem, I couldn't probably even, you know, afford enforcement. Do yeah. I still go there? Yeah, and th those those are very very good questions. For I India is 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 not uh, you know for as advanced as India is in in terms of technology and um, uh, it is not as as patent friendly. Um, at, it, it's I found it easier to get patents most of the time in China than in India. Um, the but but enforcement they're also. It, their their um, enforcement arm in India is is um, it's not bad um, and and as I mentioned earlier China's enforcement has gotten a lot better uh, than it used to be it used to be that it was almost impossible to enforce patents in China and so it really wasn't worth the the money or you know to to, to file there um, I for for most biotech companies I would consider seriously filing in China. Um, now, uh, now I, I, I would consider that seriously. Um, and also for pharma and for medical device, because they're big markets. Uh, and India, I, I, I would lean towards China over India. Um, uh, but but both of them are important. I mean, we're, we're talking a billion people in each one of those those places those are those are big markets um and and especially if your your particular your treatment or your device or whatever it is um may get there at some point or maybe you have manufacturers in china 
you may want to do that. It, it might also may be a place where your, your competitors are manufacturing. So you want to patent not because you're going to be there, but because you want to keep your competitors out of there, or at least it scares them enough to keep, keep the competitors out. Um, but again, there's, there, there is a, there is a cost benefit. There's, there's a weighing that goes on here. And if you have limited funds in, in, in your business, um, get the U S probably your next one is probably going to be Europe, um, as, as far as a big, big, big market, it's probably not going to be China. That's it. So it, it's a difficult weighing thing to do. Um, but I, I would, I, and you have to factor in, by the way, you have to factor in what are called annuities, which are yearly payments you have to pay to those foreign patent offices just to keep the patent going or the application going. Um, most often, the biggest bang for your buck is in a place where there isn't a huge market. It's Australia. You get a great bang for your buck in Australia. <laughs> Well, and a lot of our companies do their clinical trials in Australia. And if you're doing research in that company, you need to protect it. Yeah. 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 So um, nonprofits. Okay. Yeah. You don't think of the corner nonprofit as having patentable stuff, but the reality is our universities are nonprofits our hospitals are nonprofits. Um, you know, major research institutes are nonprofits is there a difference in creating an IP portfolio at a nonprofit as opposed to a for-profit? There, there are different considerations um, for universities and for hospitals. They may not be wanting to commercialize those uh, inventions themselves. So what they need to do is they need to quickly put together a, a, a provisional application get it on file and then find somebody who will license it and actually run with it and commercialize with it and commercialize it. And, and you know, find that doctor who's going to spin it out and run, run the company um, because the hospital is not going to do that. And the, the, um, the university certainly is not going to do that. And when we have universities like we do at, at ASU and U of A and, and NAU who, who churn through lots and lots and lots of inventions, and they do. They, they, they have wonderful inventions that are coming out. They can't possibly know themselves which ones are going to be the, the important ones, unless they already have somebody who said, hey, um, I invented it. I will file it. I will license it. I will run with it. Other than that, they don't know. So they just need to quickly get provisionals on file and then run around trying to find that licensee. And they do. That's that's what they do, um, and so for other nonprofits, the analysis is is similar. You don't want to spend a lot of money on on your inventions, but if you are thinking about at all trying to commercialize something, you know, for a smaller nonprofit, you may you may want to uh, do the commercialization yourself. That's a different consideration. So. You know, so many of our small companies are told, you got to patent this stuff. You have to have your patent portfolio. You have to protect your intellectual property. Um, but I know from experience, having been on the board of biotech companies, small biotech companies, that could be millions of dollars. Yeah. And, um, you know, and it's very hard to predict. Yeah, you can look at the, the fee schedules and you can chart it all out. But I don't ever remember being having a really good handle on how much it was going to cost me. How, how do, as I'm trying to plan my startup, how, who can help me understand what that range is going to look like? That's, that's a, that's a very good um, uh, question. There's, there's, um, and there, there have been a number of studies that have tried to answer that, that question. Um, in the United States, there was a paper a year last year that uh, done. It was funded by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. In fact, I found it off of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office website where they were they were trying to answer the question: How much does it cost to get a U.S. patent? They weren't trying to think about all countries outside of the United States, um, which is a whole nother, you know, uh, issue. But in the U.S., they found that on average. 
it was it was in the neighborhood of about sixty two thousand dollars to get to get a patent in the U.S. Um, and that that that's from original filing all the way through maintenance fees and everything to the end of the term. Um, and I uh, in in my experience in most technologies, my experience has been it's that it's less than that. Uh, um, and I don't know if, if maybe, maybe the people who are dragging that up are just dealing with really difficult examiners or what, but, but that's, that my experience has, has been that, it, that it's less, um, when you, when you're talking about foreign stuff and trying to protect your, your inventions outside of the U S you know, I can give you some, some rough ball, ballpark estimates, like, you know, filing in Europe, uh, without excess uh, page fees or excess claim fees is is about eleven thousand um, dollars. I already know that. Um, and and filing in China with the translations and without excess page fees or excess claim fees is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of about eight to nine thousand uh, dollars U.S. Uh, similar for Japan, a little bit less for Japan, but but uh, you know when we're talking about Australia, it's like three thousand dollars. So those are the filing costs. And then you have to think, OK, wait a couple of years for the examination to start. The examination, plug in, you know, four to six thousand dollars in examination in Australia and then an issue fee in, in Australia. And then the yearly annuities that happen in Australia. And you have a you have a rough estimate. Thanks. All right. Well, we are coming up on the end of our hour. And um, Jason, this has been terrific. Um, for those of you online, um, Jason is very easy to find as a member of the AZ Bio Board of Directors. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, if you see him at the next AZ Bio event, he would be happy to, you know, say hello and spend a little time with you. Um, so again, Jason, thank you for, for this great information. I think that it really helps to have a foundation, yeah. right? So that we can understand where we're going. Um, nobody should be doing do-it-yourself brain surgery. <laughs> um, I got news for you. If your IP is the number one thing your investors are going to look at to make sure that the value of your company is solid, you probably don't want to do your own patents either. So um, with that, you, I've, I've made a career out of trying to fix things after they've been filed. <laughs> oh, and by the way, folks, it's a lot more expensive if you got to fix it than if you do it right the first time. Yeah. So I've been there, seen it, done it. Um, it is not easy. But on behalf of AZ Bio, our AZ Bio Peers team, um, our AZ Bio Board of Directors, thank you for joining us for AZ Bio Peers.